Richard Feynman said that everything in quantum theory uh, boils down to the two slit experiment. And uh, of course, Richard Feynman was one of the greatest uh, quantum physicists of all times. The second part that he said is, no one understands this, and I don't understand it, he said. And he implied, if I don't understand, nobody understands it. <laughs> so this is the good news, bad news. This is the summary of it. The point is that, in a way, particle complementary, if you send individual particles, it could be photons and electrons, through two slits, you get a familiar interference pattern with uh, patterns of light, darkness, light, darkness, and the light and darkness fade out as you move away from the center of symmetry of this um, screen. You say, well, uh, you know, individual particles, how can they bo go through both slits? I'm going to send one at a time, and I'm going to wait. And I was talking a little while ago to Dean Rading, and he's actually going to carry out some of these experiments by putting in, he's already done it, uh, putting in conscious observers and see how the patterns change. But in any case, you send one particle at a time, right? Uh, you still get that pattern, by the way. But if you decide that you really want to know through which slit it went through, and you put a detector here, which every time a particle goes through, it goes click, guess what? You lose the interference pattern, and you get instead what is known as diffraction pattern. You get a, a pattern that is responsible for the particle aspect of light. So you can't have it both ways. They're complementary. You can tell an electron to be, that it is uh, a wave and a particle at the same time. This has gotten to the point that now we have a third aspect, namely the null locality. This is the so-called EPR experiment after the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen. Einstein always put uh, questions that were very deep and sometimes um, really wrong, but in some ways he was also right. So the EPR experiment, he didn't quite believe that you could have non-local effects, that the quantum world was non-local. So he said, well, let's send a particle over here. You prepare it in some initial quantum state. And this, by the way, was, uh, this experiment was carried out by a number of people, particularly Alain Aspect at the University of Paris. And I believe that one of these days, this guy should get the Nobel Prize, because this is a very profound experiment. Uh, John Bell, who was responsible for putting together this, um, uh, the so-called um, uh, Bell's inequalities, Unfortunately, he's not going to get it because he passed away at a fairly young age. But Alain Aspect, uh, Zollinger, Closer, and um, uh, um, uh, several other people, but let's say just Zollinger and Closer and uh, Alain Aspect, have carried out this, uh, Gissin was another one in Switzerland. They have carried out this experiment and they found that indeed the two particles are always correlated together. If you look at the pattern on the right side, you just get a random pattern. Click, 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 click. Every time a photon, let's say, in this particular case, goes through a particular polarizer, if it's polarized this way, you're going to get a click. If it's not polarized this way, you're not going to get a click, but you're going to get it here. And these angles between those two, two um, different directions, in the right and the left, can be correlated in some ways through quantum theory. And quantum theory tells you precisely what the correlation should be. And as the statement says here, the clicks on the right correlate too strongly with the clicks on the right, in a, in, on the left, with the right, in accordance with quantum theory. The correlations are very strong. This is a profound result, because it tells us that there is no locality in the universe. You cannot send signals, though. You cannot use this to send signals, because if you are in a submarine, nuclear submarine, and trying to send a signal to somebody on the land, this information, this part over here, uh, it looks random. And this part over here is random. But when you correlate them and you connect them together, then you get perfect correlation, or perfect anti-correlation, or in between, depending on the two angles. That, by the way, is described in great detail in the conscious universe. So local realistic theories, here is the problem. 
There are three premises in the classical world. And guess what? The classical world is wrong. One is realism, doctrine that physical reality exists independent of human observers. You say, yeah, whether I'm here or not, there's reality. Well, wrong. OK? Nature shows us that one of these three premises is wrong, probably the first one. The second one is scientific method. I'm not prepared to throw that away, because then we, then we cannot do science. Scientific method says that you use mathematics, phys, uh, ph logic, et cetera, et cetera, to study the universe. I believe that's still correct. Locality, no, no influence can travel fast in the speed of light. So maybe one in three are wrong. The point is that the predictions, again, of Bell's inequality, hold. It gets even weirder. You remember, we're talking about time. In this delay choice experiment, it looks like an observer opens this, I won't describe the exact situation, opens this blind, Venetian blindfold, blind, and lets the photon, if it, in this particular case, to get clicked over here and show the particle aspect. Remember, it's always the two-slit experiment, remember, we're trying to find it. But if you, you keep it closed, then you get the interference pattern over here. In fact, you can decide to do that after, after the photons have gone through this. See, but after it happened, I throw the switch. By the way, this is happening in the laboratory with nanoscience. Today, with 10 minus 9 seconds, you can do this kind of, it's not fiction. It has been done in the experiment. And you can throw the switch the last minute, and the last nanosecond, I should say, and here record either the particle aspect, or if you decide not to throw the switch, you record the, the interference pattern. And lo and behold, in that case, you have a photon that travels through both paths. In one case, it travels through one path. In the other case, it travels through both paths. You can do this experiments. John Archibald Wheeler uh, defined it for billions of light years. It doesn't really matter. The light started from a very distant quasar. In the last nanosecond, you make a decision whether you follow one path or both paths. And you say, how can that be? The light has been traveling for billions of years. It's not that you're changing the past. The act of observation brings together the two together. We live in a participatory universe. John Hagelin went through great detail of this search for unification. Let me just say here that as you go into deeper and deeper levels in the quantum realm, you reach higher simplicity, more simple, and higher energies, but also more simple. The opposite way, you're breaking symmetries. I'll skip that. This is the universe, Big Bang. This is the current paradigm of the Big Bang. Early on, about 10 to minus 35 seconds, the universe expanded exponentially, inflated by a factor of 2 every 10 to minus 35 seconds or less, reaching a huge size in uh, not even as fast as that, much faster than that. Today, we look back at the universe. One of the curious things that has made me curious is that certain numbers show up. And actually, this is not, of course, I'm not the first one. It was Paul Dirac who noticed it in Eddington, that certain numbers, such as the ratio of the electric force to gravitational force. This is as, as far as we'll go with mathematical formula tonight, so you don't need to worry too much about it. Just take that as a ratio of the electric force to the gravitational force. The gravitational force is extremely weak. You may say, how come we, if you jump out of a window, you crash, right? And I show you a little example that actually the electric force is much stronger than the gravitational force. I jump up. I go against gravity. I can jump up, right? That's the electric force winning. But the electric force and the, and the mag magnetic force zeroes out. So the only thing that is left is the gravitational force. Even though it's 10 to the 40 times smaller, it's gravity that in the end wins over the entire universe. That ratio is 10 to the 40. The same ratio, by the way, shows up when you look at the ratio of the size of the universe to an elementary particle such as an electron. Why is that so? Are those two numbers the same? And then if you take the square root, you get the number of a particle compared to the Planck length. Now, the Planck length is the size where space-time breaks down. I think we've talked about it before. Several of the speakers talked about it. 
The point is that that is the point of the beginning, the Big Bang, and also where space-time breaks down. If you take the square of that 10 to the 40, you get the number of particles in the universe. So you have some harmonic numbers, just like the Pythagoreans were saying. Time, time, time. Time seems to be flowing in one direction. Remember, we went over here. Time seems to be flowing that direction. Remember, emergence is this way. If you go the other way, eventually you reach the anti-symmetry breaking. This is symmetry breaking. You, the forces get divided. If you go the other way, they become unified until you reach the point of a single atom in the entire universe is just one atom. The brain. The brain is an extremely intricate, the most intricate object in the universe. It's the last frontier. And it covers huge scales, from the nanoscale to the size of a three pound wet, warm object that we call the brain. In there, you have things that look like there are quantum processes taking place. And certainly, we know that down at this level, at the protein level, quantum chemistry plays a role. But is it really all quantum, or is it something that can be explained in terms of classical physics? These are some of the experiments and some of the observational evidence that indeed quantum effects take place in biological systems. We don't have time to go through that, but believe me, a lot of this work now is coming together. We believe that the cerebellum and, uh, has the cognitive functions and the motor behavior, which is, again, some sort of complementarity. And to make a long story short, the universe seems to be basically informational. Mm -hmm. Basic information. Now, to make it even stranger, there's the quantum Zeno effect. If you make fast enough observations, one after the other, you can freeze the state of an atom, and it will not decay. It's amazing. The observation actually changes the state of the atom. You can freeze it. It will not decay. This is very possibly what takes place in the brain, perhaps, we don't quite know yet, to hold what's called the coherent states of the brain. Because one of the biggest problems in quantum processing in the brain is the decoherence. In terms of to the punchline, fast to the punchline, these are some of the principles that, you see there are many of them, they're not, probably not unique, that seem to characterize both quantum theory and general relativity. Cause and effect, complementarity, correspondence between large and small, non-locality, quantization, wave aspects, role of observation, <laughs> sufficient reason, there seems to be a reason why things are happening. Vacuum and Planckian dimension and vari va rapid variability. Universal physical laws, ultimate simplicity in the unification, and last but not least, primacy of process. Heraclitus of ancient Greece was right. You can never step in the river twice. It's not the same river. Process is the most important thing. The solid atoms of Democritus that he believed there were tiny little things like grains of sand are not there. Instead, you have process. Maybe this, this is the future principles of integrative science. And you see that they're actually quite similar, but more general. And now, perhaps some sort of unity can be found by looking at biological and physical systems, getting down to some sort of foundational level down here where these principles apply. So I suspect that some sort of generalized mathematics will have to be brought in. 